Jess, thanks so much for taking some time to hang with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, if you're listening, you have to go check out Jess's website, jessoconnell.com, just because it's beautiful. It's just, I love her logo. It's got these little stars all over it. It's got a cool O and it's beautifully coordinated, of course. Um, okay. So now that we like your website, we're ready to like you. Like, yes. tell us, tell us about your story. How did you get into focusing on helping people launch their online business? Yeah, this is such a good question. So I actually started my business at the start of 2019 after my husband lost his job. So I had been kind of playing, playing business at that point in like a little MLM. And I was doing enough that I felt like I was being productive, but I just was really holding myself back. And at that point, like I was a stay at home mom of two, I had a three-year-old and a six month old baby. And I didn't really need to work like we were fine and my husband lost his job unexpectedly and I realized like in that moment it was kind of that thing that shook us and I was like wait a second like somebody can take away our entire security at a whim and it like awoke something inside of me where I was like I'm not okay with somebody deciding that we're disposable and our entire life goes away Mm. and that was what really woke up the entrepreneur in my heart that was like, you know what, you could be doing so much more than this. And I was like, yeah, you know what, you're right. So I actually started my like online life as a blogger back in like 2012 when blogging was all the rage. And I had turned that into a coaching business with that multi-level marketing company. And I really like had a knack for growing communities online, growing a following and the whole thought leadership thing around blogging. And that was when I really started to lean into teaching people how to grow a following, how to grow thought leadership. And I started launching my own programs and I realized that I was kind of good at it. In my first program launch, I I did not have a flopped launch. A lot of people, the first time they launch something, it totally fails. And that was not the case for me. I had like 25 people join. I made $1,500 and it was like, holy cow, this is a thing. And so I just kept doing it. And I started to ask myself this question of like, okay, I have this little thing going. I'm making a couple thousand every time I launch, but like, what are the people who are making a couple hundred thousand doing? What are the people Mm -hmm. who are making a million dollars doing Mm -hmm. that I'm not doing? And so I got really curious and that's what really started like my obsession with launching and figuring out what made them different from what I was doing and how were they building these massive audiences and launching to them. And I created, like I took down notes. I studied what other people were doing. I implemented into my own business and saw massive growth. I took one program from $3,000 launch to an $8,000 launch to a $47,000 launch. And what was and, that what was that product that you were selling? Yeah, it was a a product teaching people in the MLM that I was previously how to sell basically, how to sure. serve course. their audience and connect yeah. it to the direct sales MLM. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. And that so using that and kind of growing that little side of my business, which is where I started, I was able to really hone in on launching and then teach people how I was able to scale that. So good. What an amazing story. I love that. And that's, I think for a lot of entrepreneurs in the online space, you start with one thing and it kind of morphs and it morphs and it morphs and you kind of find your niche of like what feels good and also what's resonating with your, you know, your, the world at large. Um, You point out on your website, kind of the difference between spaghetti launching and aligned launching. Um, Mm -hmm. Can you help us understand the difference between those two things? Yeah, absolutely. I think the core difference is energetic, probably. When you're spaghetti launching, this is what I did in the beginning too, and something I see so many people doing is having an idea, especially in the online business space. Like you have an idea and you're like, yes, this is amazing. I'm going to offer it. And you throw it out to your audience, expecting them to be as excited about it as you are. And then they're not. not. Yeah. Why wouldn't they be? And so then they're not because like, they're not in your brain. And we know like you have to have seven exposures or whatever for people to get buy-in. 
And then you start to say, oh my God, maybe it wasn't that good of an idea. And so you start to kind of backpedal and you're like, everybody hates me. Everybody hates this. I'm just going to stop talking about it. And then maybe nobody will know that I tried to launch something and I'll go back in my little cave. And then you create this belief that like launching sucks. Launching is hard. I don't want to launch. And so the next time that you go to launch something, you're like, oh, I have this new idea and it's really exciting. And you play the whole cycle over again. Mm -hmm. And maybe you get a little bit more confident. Maybe some people are used to you. So they do buy early on and you can start to see some success that way. But at the end of the day, it's not the most effective way to launch something because you are not fully committed to the success of that launch. And so aligned launching is about setting up all of the dominoes in the row so you can kick the first one and they all go down. Hmm. And so those dominoes are like attracting an aligned audience, creating a desire and demand for the solution that you have that you're going to offer them later and kind of setting up this expectation that, hey, I have a solution. You already want it and they want it by the time you offer it. Mm-hmm. And then the last piece of that is really following through, being committed to the launch and having a plan the whole way so that you're not just throwing it out to your audience and hoping for the best. You have a sales page and a launch mechanism and a email sequence and all of these things in place so that you're not kind of building the plane as you're flying it. You can go into piloting it, knowing that it's going to be complete when you get there. One of the first things that you talk about on your website is this whole idea of taking a stand, mm. sharing your truth, and that that will then attract an audience. What does that What does that mean? Take a stand, share your truth, attract an aligned audience. Yeah, this is such a big thing. And I think especially in the online business space, we tend to follow what we see other people doing. And we're like, oh, they're successful at that. That's what I should be doing because obviously that's what's successful. And at the end of the day, if you have a desire to be a thought leader, if you are like a blogger or somebody with an audience and you're sharing a message, you gained that audience because you were sharing something that was deep inside your heart. It was your deeper purpose. It was the thing that lights you up to talk about. And as entrepreneurs, that thing can move and shift and change as you see and do more things as mine has as well. But when you're coming from the place of like, this is what I am passionate about. This is what I want to talk about rather than doing what people are looking for or what everybody else is doing. That's when you can really stand out because you take a stand for something. Mm -hmm. And I like this quote. I don't know who it's from, but that's what I see so many people doing online is saying like, where are my followers? I must find them so that I can lead them. Instead of saying like, I am a leader and by taking a stand, people will follow me. And when you take a stand for something, you become known for that thing. And that's when the people who want that thing will follow you. Mm -hmm. And that's a much stronger way to build thought leadership and to build a business than trying to find your followers so that you can lead them. Yeah. What would you say that you take a stand for in business and then maybe life in general? Yeah, absolutely. So in business, I take a stand for people really op- like optimizing this thought economy that we're in. And this might get a little like high level for just a second, because this is such a great question. But I think that we're living in a time where more and more people are seeking peer-to-peer education. It's a booming industry. Even before the pandemic, it was scheduled to be like a $325 billion industry by the end of 2025, I bet we've blown that out of the water at this point because everybody was home. And so everyone's like, I want to learn how to bake sourdough. Like that is the peer to peer knowledge industry. And I think that we have this asset that so many people are not utilizing, which is their thought leadership and really selling their thoughts. And this thought economy is booming And I think that like, I take a stand for people owning that they have something to say and owning that they have an authority and that looking at the people who we used to think of as authorities, like politicians and celebrities and authors, like it's a really tiny group that we're all looking to learn from where instead right now we're craving that peer-to-peer connection and that peer-to-peer thought leadership. And so 
I stand for empowering people to find their secret genius, to find the thing inside of them that they are an authority at, and really owning that and creating a different economy. And that's my greater vision. And I recently really fleshed this out. I see in the next 10 years, really shifting the way our economy works in general, rather than having more people who are employed, having more people who are creating thought leadership and who are taking a stand and really expanding that peer-to-peer thought economy. And anybody can become a millionaire just leveraging the power of what they already know and what they can teach other people. Mm -hmm. That's big. That's big. Yeah. Taking a stand. And so that then with taking a stand on that perspective on life in terms of like thought leadership and the thought economy, then your unique way of helping that kind of come into fruition, come into the world is helping people with their launching of their products and services or whatever it is. Yeah. It's really easy to have an idea. It's really hard to take that idea and turn it into money. Mm -hmm. And something that I happen to be really good at is helping people take an idea, structure it so that it actually gets the idea across and gets people results and then market that so that they can get customers for that idea. Mm -hmm. At what point of the journey do you feel like you're best equipped or you want to help people you know, kind of in that process? Is it at the idea phase? Is it after they've already created the course? Is it before they have the client, you know, the audience after they have like, what, what's your sweet spot of helping people? Yeah. I love helping people who know that they have something to say and they want to kind of get a bigger megaphone. So people who have a deeper purpose, who are not necessarily chasing the, their followers to see what they want to offer, but the people who are like already internally thought leaders who want to expand their, um, expand their reach. For example, I just finished launching with a client who is a celebrity dog groomer and she has a TV show on HBO max all around dog grooming. She has a booked out salon in LA and she wanted to reach her bigger audience by creating dog grooming courses And so I helped her create and launch her dog grooming course. And she was able to get, I think it was 650 new students, made $150,000 out of something just out of thin air, using something she was already great at and already known for, and just creating this whole new revenue stream. I mean, it came out of thin air, but it was a lot of work. It was a lot of work to put it all together, but she already had the knowledge really is what you're saying. Yes. The knowledge, she has to package the knowledge and then create a mechanism Mm -hmm. to connect people with that. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Um, what would you say, um, are the, you said the, you know, biggest challenges it seems like in the launching process is the spaghetti approach. Let me, I've got this idea. Let me throw it out there, Mm -hmm. but let's just say somebody's taking more of a deliberate approach. They're not, they do have somewhat of an audience. Um, you know, the launch process, as I work with people, does feel so overwhelming, all the little details. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, there are people that um, come alongside and kind of help with those details. I'm hearing you seem a little bit more high level than just like, I'm going to help you as a VA be, you know, doing details. You're helping them really master plan the whole thing and strategize the whole thing. Yeah. Um, but what would you say if somebody, you know, maybe somebody doesn't have the money to invest in you? Um, because I'm assuming you work on a flat fee versus a percentage on the backside. Like if they don't have the money that to invest in you, what are their options? You know what I mean? Like they're wanting to grow their business, but they're going, I'm not at the Jess O'Connell level. Okay. She's working with freaking people on TV. Okay. I'm like (laughs) this little person who's got like this little course. Like, what would you suggest to them that they could do to help kind of get clear on, Um, how they can launch more successfully. Yeah. One of the things that I take a stand for is education at every level. And so I serve people with my podcast for free. I have a $9 launch checklist that lists out all of those things that you have to do and is like, it's really fancy. You like put in the launch date and it like auto populates all the due dates for things. It's pretty cool. Um, But like, so serving people at a $9 price point all the way up to working as like a launch mentorship at like a $12,000 price point. So 
I think that that's something that I teach people too, is how to create levels for the people that you work with so that you can help people where they're at and then help them grow up to that next level. Because as like, as you are growing and learning, you might want more levels of commitment or deeper like connection with somebody. And so really creating those different levels is really important to me. Yeah. Um, talk to me about the podcast, the launch fix. Um, what, who, who should be listening to this? What are they going to learn? Talk, talk me through it. Yeah. The launch fix is for a, somebody who's in the online business space, whether they have a course already, or maybe they don't yet, or somebody who's launched before to varying levels of success. And they want to learn about these bigger principles of launching and also hear other people's experience launching. Something we're bringing onto the podcast here soon is regular launch debriefs, where I sit down with everyday entrepreneurs and talk about their $100 launch or their $100,000 launch, their million-dollar launch or their $1,000 launch, and really looking at the numbers, looking at what it took, and most importantly, looking at the lessons that you learned in that process through like every single level. I think there's so many people who are starting out at launching and they're like, yeah, I see this person had a $70,000 launch, but I'm not there yet. And so they start to feel like, well, maybe that they're not successful because they haven't done that. And I've had the thousand dollar launch. Like that's how I started my business. And it changed my life because I celebrated that. And I didn't look at it as a failure. Mm-hmm. And so I want to highlight people at every single level so that you can see somebody whose business looks like yours at the level you're at, and you can still learn from that and move forward. Mm-hmm. So one of the things that I'm curious about is the idea of launching versus ongoing being, you know, open. Like so an I, evergreen? I, yeah. Evergreen or just, it's just available to, to, yeah. to purchase. Right. I mean, like maybe there's not like this big funnel, maybe it's just more of an option on a website. So like, for instance, I just launched, um, a month ago, a product called rise up creatives and it's an online, um, tool for entrepreneurs to help them stand out and save time on social media. They get a bunch of graphic design, um, templates that are all drag and drop similar to Canva, but it's on our own platform. They get monthly 31, um, lifestyle, uh, images. And they get monthly 31 customizable captions. Nice. So all this together. And we help them, right? So um, I am definitely no expert on launching. Let me tell you, I have done it and I've, you know, not had big launches. I've had, you know, mm, no, and then mm, kind of okay launches. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that I wrestled with was, do I do this as like, because I see some people, i.e. like a social curator, which you may be familiar with, with Jasmine Star. She does these big launches, right? Mm -hmm. That's her whole strategy. Whereas Canva, right? They don't do launches. It's just open all the time. Yeah. Right. So I kind of did a launch, um, both US and Filipino audience, Southeast Asia, and um, uh, was okay. Now I'm, it's just open and available but I'm then partnering with some brand ambassadors to do kind of almost like a webinar Mm -hmm. that talks to people about social media and then invites them into a seven day free trial or something like that. Yeah. Um, Do you see that an option for a hybrid model where there are launches, you know, here and there where it's always, or is it just like cart open cart close? You find that that's the very best approach to any product or service. This is such a good question. I think it really depends. So I also have a membership model. It's kind of like a back-end membership for an offer that I have. And it's something that I've never launched. It's an upsell to another product. And so like you can order bump it on the sales page, or if you're in the product, I kind of regularly mention it and am enrolling people casually that way. Mm -hmm. I think that that works because the monthly deliverables change. And so if you have like, okay, it's July, like here's the July package. I think you have an opportunity with like organic marketing to create desire and demand for that. And then that's kind of the scarcity, right? They want to get in for the July package and creating desire for that. 
I do. I love the idea of doing like joint venture webinars and kind of utilizing other people's audiences to bring it in. But I think that there should be some kind of like reason for people to join now. Mm-hmm. And I think that you get that a little bit with the scarcity of the monthly theme. Does it change monthly or do they, is that how that works? Yeah, it changes monthly. And um, unlike like Social Curator, once you get that month, if you don't enroll, then you have to pay $50 for the previous months. And so what okay. we're doing right now is offering them the two previous months are just always included. So, mm-hmm. you know, like uh, if you enroll in June, you get April and May, you know, that are just yeah. there available to you. So, yeah. Gotcha. Okay, cool. Are you driving traffic to that in any specific way or is it just kind of sitting on your website? Right now it is because we just literally just created this a month ago. So I'm frankly just finding my way and um, had a big push in the beginning, put, you know, money toward Facebook ads and so forth. And then, um, so now I've been focused on the joint venture, developing the relationships. Mm -hmm. I've been on, you know, probably 30 podcasts um, talking about it, giving away the free seven day free trial. So I'm right now I'm not running ads to it. Um, I spent so much time creating it and now I know I did it a little backwards. (laughs) Now I'm actually, you know, more marketing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah. No, I think that's interesting. I think that now that it's created, you have the opportunity. Sorry, I have like a tickle in my throat. (laughs) Um, to drive traffic to it. And so maybe that is through like a tripwire funnel where you have like a freebie that you run Facebook ads to. And then on the back end of that freebie, you're offering, Hey, try seven days for free. And you could even do like three templates as the freebie and they get three captions and images or whatever. Mm. And then the back end is like, Hey, try our free trial or join for 50% off for your first month or whatever, like a way to capture them. So what I like to think about, and I think this is important in all marketing is like, what is the carrot that will attract the rabbit that you want to catch? And so thinking of like either low level offers, like a self-liquidating offer funnel or like a $9 launch checklist is what is the carrot that if they bite that carrot, they're going to be aligned clients for the greater offer. Mm -hmm. And so thinking like, what is the carrot I can create that I can then generate like traffic to either through podcasts, social media, like all the organic methods, or even through paid advertising, which I'm a big fan of Facebook ads and getting people into that carrot so that you then can move them down that rabbit hole to your offer. And so I think that that could be a great way to do it. And maybe you have like that monthly scarcity where you, (laughs) here's your Facebook ad strategy. You run it to a freebie with a tripwire into either 50% off the first month or like a seven day free trial. Mm -hmm. And then you retarget the people who see that ad with the monthly theme. And every month you change it and you're like, Hey, July, we're talking all about this. Like get these blah, blah, blah. And I think that with that, you'll start to generate that buzz and bring in that consistent revenue without having to launch it. Mm -hmm. For people that aren't familiar with the term tripwire, do you mind explaining that? Yeah, absolutely. I'm not exactly sure where the term originated, but what it is, is an offer immediate. Huh? Probably the Vietnam war. (laughs) Probably. Right. (laughs) It's true. It's the thing that like, if you kick it, it explodes, um, which is not the most empowering thing. But (laughs) in marketing terms, though, immediately after either a low cost or free offer, the thank you page, instead of just saying like, thank you, check your email, is another offer. And the mindset behind this is that like it gives people buy-in. So if they've opted into the freebie, they obviously have the problem that that you are then solving. And so putting that offer immediately in front of them kind of gives them, they're like, oh, I want this solved. And it's like, do you really want it solved? And so they're more willing to pay at that moment. Um, Another way that people are doing this right now is with a self-liquidating offer funnel, which is a low cost paid offer followed by a higher ticket paid offer, um, which kind of like transitions that. And the intention behind that is that buyers are more likely to buy. And the reason why it's called self-liquidating is Yes, because the ads for it are expensive. And so the intention in running ads to a paid offer is to get 
the ad cost, like the cost per lead to be the same price as the initial offer. So if you have a $37 offer, you will be spending $37 per lead for that offer. And this can freak people out. In fact, it has freaked me out in the past. Yeah, it is freaky. Yeah. You're not supposed to spend that much money on Facebook ads. And you're like, oh my God, I'm spending like $100 a day and I'm getting like two purchases. But at the end of the day, like, is it paying for itself? It's not a profit generating thing. It is a lead generating thing. And I think that that's one of the biggest misconceptions with tiny offers is that I'm going to make a hundred thousand dollars with a tiny offer. And it's like, you're really not, you're going to make it on the back end of that. It's going to cost you a little bit of like stomach. Like you have to have the, the gut for it to attract those leads, but they are greater leads at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. All of these things that you're talking about for a lot of um, my audience will be really overwhelming. You know, yeah. the amount of work that it entails to put together this, because it's not just the thought process. First of all, you have to know how to do what you're saying, mm -hmm. but then sitting down and going, what about all the technology? What about all of the, I got to write all this stuff. What, how many emails, how many, what I got to write these pages. I got to create these pages. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a lot of work. Now, do you offer kind of a done for you system on this or are you more of a doing it along like with them? It's more of a done with you. I have actually thought about doing a done for you service. It's not something I do right now, but it's something I've definitely considered because you're right. There's so much to this and you're the expert at what you're the expert at. You're not necessarily the expert at marketing it. And so there's a lot to be said to hiring a team who can do all of this for you to make you more money. And so that is definitely something I've considered putting together, but I do want to address that if you're listening to this right now and you're like, oh my God, self-liquidating trip funnel, like what is happening right now? Ultimately launching comes down to having an audience that wants it, creating an offer they want and offering it to them. It doesn't have to be any more complicated than that. And the reason why your launches in the past have not been as successful is because one of those three elements is off. Either your audience does not know that they have the problem that you solve, or they don't want a solution bad enough to buy it. Your offer is not clear enough that it's the solution to their problem, or they don't believe that you're the person to solve it, or you're not offering it to them because you have some kind of belief about offering. And if you can do those three things, have an audience that has the problem that you solve and they want it solved, have an offer that solves the problem that they have and create and like get it out there, offer it to them. That's all it takes to grow your business. It seems like to me that the main missing element in those three is number one. 100%. The audience, right? Yes. The, the, to build that audience that has... Um, some sense of cohesive identity and mm -hmm. the same problem. Like that is the number one challenge. Yeah. And so what's ironic is that most entrepreneurs start with the, the product or service. You know, it's like, I got this idea for this great thing. And it's like, okay, well, that's great. Now you really are passionate about this thing. Mm -hmm. But in order to sell that thing, you have to become a marketer. You have yeah. to become a marketer. Like you're not, you get, if you get into business, you're in the business of marketing. You're not just yes. in the business of creating a painting or creating mugs or making a bracelet. Like you, yeah. you have to build an audience somehow. Yeah. And um, a lot of people don't have the uh, stomach for that, the patience mm -hmm. for that, you know, the process yeah. that it takes a process. And otherwise, you know, I tell people, I go, well, really what you have is a hobby. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's okay to have hobbies. Yeah. But if you're not going to do the work, you're not going to have a business. You're really and not. I, I think the hardest thing too, is that marketing is so counterintuitive and something that I see so many people who are in like the creative business space, or even in like the thought leadership space is that they think that they need to be like everybody else, look like everybody else in order to be successful. Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, we hear a lot about this term, like magnetic attraction, right? You want to attract your ideal clients to you like a magnet. Mm -hmm. And yet they're showing up online like everybody else, not saying anything loud, like just being as vanilla as humanly possible uh, because they don't want to push anybody away. Right. Oh, you want that? I can do that. Right. It's that mindset. 
And what I believe is that, well, and what science believes is that magnets are polarizing, right? You have the positive charge of a magnet, which is the attraction charge. And the magnet is only as powerful as it is polarizing. You have that negative charge. You have to be willing to push people away in order to attract people. Mm. People follow polarizing people. And I want to be really clear. Being polarizing does not mean being controversial. It does not mean saying things that upset people. It does not mean being like negative. What I mean is taking a stand. What makes you different? What makes you unique? And really, instead of trying to blend in and trying to be like everybody else, what is the stand that you take that makes you stand out? What are the industry norms or the status quo that other people are doing that you totally disagree with? Mm -hmm. And how can you stand out because of that? Mm -hmm. And it's when you create that differentiation, when you are willing to push people away, that's when you truly do attract those aligned clients. Mm -hmm. And you have to be willing to do that in order to stand out and in order to like really attract those people who want what you have to offer. Mm -hmm. How would you say that you are polarizing? Like, I know I've heard you say what you take a stand for, but like, what, yeah. how are you polarizing? I think that a lot of people are teaching the opposite of that in general. Like, don't say anything, like just like follow your audience, create whatever they want. And I totally disagree with that. I think that taking a stand for what you create and attracting your audience is something that is polarizing in the industry. And then also taking a stand against like, throwing things out there and launching like spaghetti and really having that more um, methodical aligned approach. And so I, I don't think that like throwing offers out there is how you become successful. You Mm -hmm. have to take a step back and really think about it and attract the audience first. And I think that that is polarizing in like the launch industry. Mm -hmm. Okay jessoconnell.com and the launch fix podcast.com uh both beautiful websites and jess i just love your passion and your oh you just you're you know your stuff you obviously know your stuff so well and uh, i appreciate you sharing just some some wisdom and uh, i've i selfishly am you know i'm going to rewatch a couple of these things and go hmm, Good. all right i'm going to take a couple of these tips here I hope to see your trip while you're up and running. Yeah. Thank you so much, Jess. I appreciate it. You're so welcome. Thank you so much for having me.